Hi, good morning all and uh, hello uh, dear panelists. Thank you for joining uh, the uh, webinar on COVID-19 and the future of food. I'm Sarah Kem, VP Did Flow at Trendlines Agri-Food Fund. Trendlines is an investment company based in Israel, traded in Singapore Stock Exchange. We have been actively investing in agri-food startup in Israel and globally through our different investment vehicles, incubators, the Bayer Trendlines Fund, and now, uh, and now recently the Singaporean based fund. I'm happy to host this webinar to discuss disruption, security, and supply chains. And with that, I'd like our three panelists to introduce themselves. Elena, let's start with you. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Helene. I'm from Hong Kong originally. I'm the co-founder and director of Indaguna Singapore, Indaguna Dubai, and Maxi. We operate as a food and beverage importer for the last over 20 odd years in Singapore, 15, 15 years in Dubai, and Maxi is our new startup two years ago. So we operate as a food and beverage importer and distributor to the B2B sector in various countries. And with Maxi, we started our online delivery platform in Dubai and Singapore. Today, this group of companies belongs to a group called Food Service APME, where we use our current network to distribute to food service sectors, retailers, online deliveries, B2C, across six countries in Asia Pacific and the Middle East. I'm also the founder and chairman of Indiguna Productions, a halal food manufacturing plant based in UAE. We produce a wide range of um, premium quality products, including the very much talk about alternative eating with uh, plant-based protein. Great. Xinyi, to you. Sure. Thanks, Sarai. Hi, I'm Sin Yi from Pinduoduo, and uh, I am the Director of Investor Relations at Pinduoduo. Pinduoduo is the second largest e-commerce platform in China in terms of users. So we have uh, 628 million annual active buyers and then uh, close to 500 million monthly active users. So you can imagine, uh, you know, almost anyone who is online shopping in China is today a Pinduoduo user as well. Um, so we did over 1 trillion RMB worth of GMV last year. Um, so we're still a fairly young company. We're growing quite quickly and um, agricultural produce is actually one of our larger categories. So thank you so much for the opportunity to uh, be on this panel and I look forward to a great discussion. Richard? Hi, good morning or good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm Richard. I'm the Chief Retail Officer for Lazada Singapore. Um, Lazada Singapore um, is uh, a business which encompasses uh, both general merchandise and, and food retail. And my role in Singapore is to look after the, the Redmart label. So Redmart is a, is a food retailer and e-commerce grocer within Singapore. But my, my remit also includes um, general merchandise too, so anything to do with retail on our, on our platform. Um, Lazada is, is um, Southeast Asia's leading um, e-commerce platform um, across all six countries. Um, we, we lead in terms of the daily active users, uh, the number of buyers and also the number of sellers. Um, and we, we are part of the wider Alibaba family um, and Alibaba's principal investment outside of China um, in the region. Thank you, Richard. So I'm curious and I think also the audience as a consumer uh, we've all seen that online grocery shopping has increased. What is, do you think was the most uh, effective, uh, the pandemic affected your current business? What is the, the main effect on your business during the pandemic? Uh, Simi, let's start with you. Sure. So um, Pinduoduo actually sells all categories of goods, right? So it's uh, apparel, FMCG, as well as uh, um, agricultural goods, which I mentioned earlier. So you can imagine, um, you know, for certain categories that are more um, discretionary, right? Uh, for instance, apparel or cosmetics, those will be impacted. But definitely, I think in terms of uh, FMCG groceries, uh, we definitely saw an uptick in interest, especially for agricultural produce. Um, so I did prepare a slide. I don't know if um, the uh, the organizers might be able to bring it up. So this just gives you a quick overview of kind of the scale of um, you know agricultural goods sales on Pinduoduo so far, 
right? So um, in general, in China, the online penetration for uh, fresh produce online is actually quite uh, limited. So despite China being a very sophisticated country uh, in terms of the high online penetration uh, for agricultural goods, it has historically been kind of in the low single to mid single digits. So uh, I think the, the main impact of COVID is actually to uh, force a lot of the consumers to explore uh, different ways in which they can you know, still procure these products when there's a disruption to their usual kind of uh, shopping behaviors. So we definitely saw um, you know, more people uh, attempt or, or buy uh, maybe for the first time, right, fresh meat, fresh fish, uh, as well as some uh, agricultural goods uh, during this period. So I think uh, net net, um, you know, it's generally been, I think, a positive for the online uh, grocery, online fresh food uh, delivery. Uh, sort of industry development in China. Richard, how about you in Singapore? I think I think I would echo some of those. Um, it's, it's quite interesting to see see the parallels across countries, and I, I think everyone will see from from the media. There's a lot of similarities ac across countries and territories. Um, what I would say that the main effects in, on the online grocery uh, world, specifically anyway, is is, uh, is is a huge increase in fresh penetration. So. Um, as my as my colleagues said there, um, so we we've seen a, a, an increase of more than fifty percent in in customers purchasing fresh goods um, over, over the course of, of three or four months that we've seen. And um, I think generally for me, um, do, doing fresh food in retail is difficult anyway. Doing doing fresh food in e-commerce is super hard um, with with the constraints and the barriers and uh, that, that customers do have. So it's kind of it's almost customers have seen this as a um, they, they've, they've dropped their barrier to, to that initial purchase and actually what we're seeing is a, is a very, very high repeat rate of customers that have tried it for the first time. So um, the confidence factor that we have, that we know we have in terms of our, our fresh supply chain, whether that's our products, our quality or, or our delivery on time and our, our cold chain is, is completely um, validated in our eyes. So our, our customers are really voting to say actually they, they agree with that. Um, but what we've we've also seen is is a very distinct um, channel shift in what people uh, in where people are purchasing their groceries from, um, and we've seen a, a greater than fifty percent increase in in number of customers um, that are coming to us. But um, um, it's it, it's generally uh, and I'd, I'd stay more more of an overwhelming um, initial um, uptake in terms of customers switching into online for, for the for the obvious reasons of social distancing and um, and uh, in, in some cases, like in, in Singapore specifically, it was very distinct governmental advice to, to stay indoors and shop online. So um, it, it, it's been a very distinct channel shift. Um, but what, what that does bring with us, with it is, um, is, uh, is a very concentrated in, um, increase in, in that demand. Um, and from a, from a retail business that are used to managing very closely uh, footfall and availability, particularly uh, when you have a, 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 such an increase in a very short space of time, um, it's difficult to manage. And I think, in, again, in, in Singapore, we had a, a very distinct moment where the government uh, had announced the, the increase of the, of the code, of the, uh, from a code orange, as we called it. Um, and in the space of 90 minutes, we took uh, almost three or four weeks worth of actual sales um, in the 90 minutes preceding that announcement. So very clearly um, customers were aware of it, but we were, we were happily on uh, set up to be able to service that demand over that short space of time. So to, to follow up on that, I know that in some countries in Israel, where I'm based, we had shortage in uh, specific ingredients like eggs, um, and they even limited the amount that you can buy online. And when I spoke to Simi before the panel, she mentioned that actually in China, maybe was the opposite. And we saw that also in some countries that they had to throw the agricultural producers had to throw a lot of uh, produce uh, to waste. Um, Richard, did you have any shortage in specific items in Singapore? And especially because we Singapore did. is such an island, right? 90% is being imported. Correct. So I, I think we, we have a, a unique challenge in a way. Um, as you say, Singapore is the, the is so highly dependent on, on the extended supply chain and then in some cases, depending on the product category, it's, it can be very fragmented. Um, so I think in pretty much every country around the world, I've seen toilet roll as being the, the initial shortage. Um, I, I'm still struggling to understand why that is, is the case. Um, um, 
but it's I, I take some comfort in the fact that every other retailer on on the planet had the same issue that I did, so that, that's okay, I think. Um, but we, we we did see um, initial disruptions with as you mentioned eggs again is um, again in, in Asia it's a very it's a staple ingredient in a lot of dishes. Um, um, just widening it out slightly, uh, things like fresh fresh foods um, because of the, the time critical nature of the supply chain. Um, any disruptions of things like uh, flights uh, had had, a, had an initial impact on on availability. So I think what most people don't don't realise when they're when they're flying um, somewhere on holiday or on a business trip, kind of below their feet is between 30 and 40 kilo, uh, tons of cargo, which could be fresh foods, it could be any, any medical equipment, things like that. So any disruption to the, the passenger uh, flight network had a, had a huge impact on, on that. And um, so we, we, we saw that initially, um, but also the, it, it's, it's also a, a bit of a, a mental effect from a consumer perspective. So. Um, people called it panic buying, um, almost like preparing for some kind of war, and like, like the, the psychology of I must stock up for the next two months um, for certain products certainly kicked in. It's more of a survival instinct, which is totally understandable. Um, but that, in in a way, if your shelves on your virtual shelves or your physical shelves look empty, people then will will start to buy something that is broadly similar to it. So if if you're, um, if brand A of the product you usually buy is out of stock or not on the shelf, you'll buy brand C and brand D, and you probably buy more of it just in case it's it's a, the perception that there's going to be a continued shortage. Which, um, in most cases, the the extended supply chain recovered within about three or four weeks, which again is a long time in in the retail world, but um, it just takes some time. And Elaine, for you dealing with more high end produce, do you share the same experience? Well, we what, what we have actually is a little bit different to Richard because we most of the products that we plan for is planned for at least uh, 30 days in stock, except for the per very highly perishable products that we used to deal with, like live seafood and uh, fresh produce outside of our neighbor countries. Um, these products are certainly affected. I think prior to this COVID-19, there was still a high demand of products from around the world, from Europe, from Australia, from US, where products are flown in or shipped in by sea. I think for the first probably um, three, four weeks, we were still um, in a good position. But subsequently, when the flights um, uh, were cut because um, borders control, and also with that, the increment of uh, freight rates across everywhere has, uh, is prohibiting actually import of all of these things. So in our business, what we do now, we um, concentrate a lot more in neighborhood uh, country sourcing, like for us, uh, for example, produce, where we used to bring in, for example, from Australia or France or, or the US is now um, primarily coming from Malaysia, where we work with our farmers. Actually, we worked with them for the last 20 years, but in the last four to six weeks, we have speed up in a in an accelerated manner to bring in quality products into Singapore on a daily basis. And that has worked quite well. Um, but you're right that it's not just shortage. There's also a massive overflow of products where restaurants, catering, airlines cannot be using the products, where we also started a program to help these um, uh, farmers to, um, uh, to try to help them reduce food wastage and to disseminate the products to other areas of the businesses uh, yeah, primarily home consumers um, to try to help them to uh, reduce their food waste. Okay. So talking again about the consumers, I'm interested to learn about some of the trends you saw with consumer behavior and consumer shopping, whether it's more processed food or more price sensitive items. Sini, um, why don't you start? Ah, oh, sorry, Helen, please. sorry, sorry. No, no, please. <laughs> No, but I mean, like in our business, actually, primarily 80% of our clients before were always, we were talking to chefs, restaurateurs or, or operators in, uh, in the restaurant business. Today, we are talking to a whole new set of customers where maybe they don't really know how to cook, but they're still missing, you know, like the restaurant quality food. And that's where we came in part to, uh, produ to be able to supply them with uh, quality of products that were supposed to be for restaurants. And today they have the chance to... Um, to get a hand on. Um, to be very honest, before the COVID-19, we are very much focused on food service sector and supporting the retailers in doing their business. 
And uh, since the COVID-19, uh, we have uh, pivoted into having an online delivery system as well, where we see people also like to buy quality restaurant food, but preferably ready to cook or ready to eat. Yeah. I was personally impressed with the variety of cherry tomatoes come from Israel, who invented the cherry tomato. So we we'll could do for that. <laughs> yes, we do, we do. We, we're getting a whole range of heirloom cherry tomatoes and different tomatoes from uh, Malaysia on a daily basis. Yeah. Cool. So Sini, how about some consumer trends in China that you noticed? Yeah, sure. So uh, I think obviously, I think for fresh, right? So I mentioned earlier that the penetration, uh, we think, you know, has gone up and probably will stay up. Um, so this is a good long term trend. Uh, I think actually for certain um, convenience foods, those have also done pretty well. So uh, for instance, there, I think before COVID already, there was a trend where, you know, people like to buy these sort of um, self-heating hot pots, right? So it's kind of like an instant noodle, but, uh, you know, it's just, uh, you don't even need uh, a stove, right? So I think a lot of these convenience foods, people, um, you know, stockpile them. It's, it's just good to have some on hand, right? And then also uh, snacks. Uh, generally, I think, um, you know, a lot of that has been moving online uh, during the COVID outbreak break as well. And I think, you know, kind of to Elaine's uh, pretty uh, earlier point, um, you know, as a consumer, I also saw, for instance, some of the uh, restaurants pivoting to sell their supplies. So the restaurants, you know, it may not be economical for them to just do a takeout business, but then some of them basically they have stockpiles, right, of the fresh produce that people also want to get. So they then sort of repackaged it and then just said like, okay, you know, uh, here's a bundle, right, of uh, veggies and meat and whatever. Uh, and then they, they effectively became the new kind of grocery store. So that was pretty interesting to see. And Richard, how about uh, the trends you saw? It's interesting. Again, again, so, some similarities, but um, I think that there's, there's some, if, if, I, if I kind of divorced the, the, the panic buying um, um, behavior to the, what I think is the more longer term structural changes, I think, um, as Helen mentioned, um, we definitely saw customers buying up, up trading um, in terms of products. So if I look at meat and seafood, for example, um, it's, it's a notoriously difficult category for customers to adopt online. Um, but what we saw was um, a much uh, a higher accelerated um, purchase rate of, of those categories. Um, but also people were, people were trading up into the, into the, the more premium cuts, uh, whether it's in, in the meat or the seafood. And I, th I think that's that's pretty understandable if you think that a lot of the F and B retail outlets uh, were closed, so people were very definitely preparing cooking at home much more. Um, and I, th I think um, in terms of the, the also the Pindodo experience, I think people were buying much many more fresh categories as well. So people were definitely cooking, scratch cooking at home, and buying a much wider um, selection of fruit and veg um, for their their daily weekly needs. Um, I think we also saw, uh, we've seen a trend developing in Frozen as well. So um, Frozen is, has become pretty popular and outside of the, the normal categories, such as ice cream and, and such, um, people have also seen and, and actually understand and appreciate the, the range that we have as Red Mart. So, so Red Mart, we, we have by far the largest range in terms of grocery in Singapore and probably the region. So we have close to 160,000 items on sale um, and if, if, if their a customer's regular first choice of, of cuts was unavailable because of this panic buying that we were seeing, well, people were actually exploring our range a little bit more and, and actually understanding we had some super premium um, categories of products. So, um, and again, trying them once and repeat buying. So um, that, that, that's pretty interesting for me. And, and Frozen was one area that we saw people, our customers adopting because potentially they were, again, trying to stock up their fresh goods, but they, it, that's a, it's like a proxy for stocking up on fresh goods, if that makes sense. You, you, you buy your, your meat and seafood and, you, and your, your produce in frozen form instead. Um, it gives you the surety that you've got a week's worth of stock in your, in your freezer at home. Um, and then jumping in, into non-fresh, I think we saw, we've seen a very strong increase in alcohol sales. Um, <laughs> and that's, again, that, that, that's, that's probably to do with being firstly stuck at home. And if you've got children like I have, you're probably drinking <laughs> more. Uh, um, but 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 also um, it, it's very highly correlated to to the lack of travel. So people aren't going to duty free. They're not stocking up on the way home from their flight. So as a as a retailer, we we've definitely seen the benefit of that. And um, again, we, with having a very wide range of, of alcohol or spirits or beers, 
um, customers are really appreciating the offer that we have and the range that we have and, and shopping from all categories. So uh, hope, uh, we're definitely seeing signs that that will continue as well, even uh, after these um, restrictions have been lifted. And with utilizing those trends, the consumer trends, have you implemented any special programs or promotion? And in response to those challenges that the pandemic uh, rise or just because of there's an opportunity? Well, yes, well, definitely we try to think about how difficult and I guess between our own employees and our own team, we also figure out what is the t challenging things about cooking at home. So we are working with uh, different chefs to create recipes and menus and also like uh, bundle up themes like, um, uh, for example, hot pot. We have the theme for hot pots where we have already a selection of products that will like just fit the hot pot theme. We also have high tea theme where you say, well, do you want to have high tea with your girlfriends over Zoom calls? Then you can order <laughs> like a range of products already bundled up for high tea and those kind of things. So, um, of course, definitely, um, this is a very different uh, business model for us totally. And um, I have to say salute to the whole team we have that we used to figure think, think of what the chef thinking today. I have to, we have to think about what the normal person is. They are not industrial from the industry. They don't have really knowledge of cooking. What makes it easier for them to have a decent meal at home? And these are the things that has really changed. And I think that um, uh, has been amazing because it is so different. We are 27 years in business in Singapore. Our whole team are pretty much Focus on talking to people who knows about food, and today we have to think about what we um, what we are talking to. The people we're talking to may not really know, or probably have never really cooked. Um, but uh, it has been has been great, and we've got a lot of feedback. And yeah, that's that's what we've been doing differently. Cindy, I know that in Pindundo you've done a lot of uh, active social uh, streaming live, different promotions. Yeah, so actually we, we did have a variety of um, kind of efforts that we rolled out um, specifically. I think not just helping the consumer get, uh, you know, fresh produce, get the things that they want, but also to help the farmers, right? So helping the farmers to sell is one part of it. And then the other part is actually, uh, because we are a general purpose e-commerce platform, we also sold some things to the farmers. So the farmers could also buy uh, farming inputs from us, right? So you could buy fertilizer, you could buy seeds, uh, and then they also receive online training. So just to run you through some numbers, uh, we actually saw a number of the uh, farmers who were affected by the logistics disruptions, right? They're kind of sitting on their crops and they're unable to get it to the market through the typical uh, means that they would have relied on, right? So um, historically, a lot of the uh, fresh produce trade in China is still done offline, right? So there is a wholesaler who comes around and he will sort of negotiate with the farmers and then sort of bundle it up and bring it on to maybe another layer and then another layer that it reaches the uh, final endpoint, which is the supermarket, maybe in a big city, right? So the consumer ends up paying quite a bit of a markup, right? Because of all those layers. Now with the COVID-19 disruptions, a lot of these uh, wholesalers were not able to sort of do their usual purchasing, but that also meant that the clock was ticking for the farmers who are sitting on a lot of their produce, which they can't really monetize, right? So they need that cash flow for the next planting season. So what we did was we created a dedicated channel uh, on our app, right, it's called Help the Farmers. So uh, we also collated information from the farmers. They were able to send uh, via WeChat mini program, submit some information, right, uh, I'm so-and-so, I'm maybe in uh, Hunan, right, I have uh, maybe half a ton of potatoes, et cetera, et cetera, together with the photos. And our team basically worked very quickly to create listings for these products. And because our app is very much an interactive, uh, almost like browsing Facebook or Instagram kind of experience, right, you as a consumer, uh, you know, if I put the right product in front of you, you may not care so much whether it's potatoes from Hunan or potatoes from Anhui, right? It's just, you know, okay, this is the product and it looks very affordable and um, I'm helping a farmer, so why not? So we could then prioritize uh, these products, right? Really get it in front of the consumer, drive traffic to help to clear through a lot of these volumes. So uh, between, I would say, probably from the beginning of February till about mid-April, we helped to sell over 300,000 metric tons of produce through this mm -hmm. channel alone. Yeah, so a lot of that was really, uh, I think one, you know, just uh, funneling sort of the latent traffic that we already had on our platform, right? 
right? Remember, people are stuck at home. They actually have even more time to browse online. And then on our part, getting the information very quickly, right? And then figuring out, okay, these are the pockets. These are the, the farmers that need the help. Uh, and then on the logistics side, right, I gathered, you know, there, there'll be a lot of questions about how this actually works. Uh, the Chinese government did actually designate certain uh, kind of logistics providers as the um, sort of priority uh, logistics providers who would have uh, access, right, especially to areas that were locked down. So uh, agriculture is also a big sector that the government has placed a lot of focus on. So they also help to expedite the shipping of uh, these sort of time sensitive products out from the uh, affected areas. And then another thing that we did was we also had live streaming. So that was also to garner even more interest, right? Because, uh, you know, if you think about it, maybe buying for fruit is not the most exciting thing in, in the world. Uh, but if you can inject some interactivity, if you can inject some fun, right? And you make something that you typically have done offline as close to, uh, you know, what, what it was, right, online, then that can help bridge some of that gap, right? And help, help drive uh, greater adoption. So we had maybe, you know, the, the village uh, mayor, the county uh, leaders, the community leaders, they would join the farm Farmers, right, to sort of showcase their specialty produce, right, sort of talk about, well, these are, you know, the oranges that, that come from our, our area, these are the orchards, right, so when you're shopping on our platform and you buy, you click a large orange, right, this is, this is how large the large orange is, right, so there's no surprises, right, so it's, it's really trying to uh, get the consumers on board and get them as comfortable as possible, and that's basically, I think, something that we see uh, potentially continuing on for quite some time, right? As people still, even though the lockdowns have lifted, they're still a bit more cautious, right, about just going out, spending as much time outside. So, how do we bring some of that offline experience uh, online through technologies like live streaming? Cool, Richard. How about in Lazada? Well, we we had um, we had a. A, a twofold challenge from that perspective. So we were we were very agile in terms of changing our product offering and our merchandising, um, but we also had a, a challenge where we were we were designated as a as an essential firm here in Singapore. So we were um, we had to um, kind of scale our business to serve more customers because of, as I mentioned earlier, the kind of the the wider government advice to basically encourage people to shop online for for the initial period of lockdown. So. We, we had to we were given a mandate to, to, to increase our number of deliveries um, pretty aggressively to to kind of help with that um, that kind of social distancing so so we, we we actually took some decisions to reduce our range on offer so um, again in line with some of the the panic buying so we, we actually cut our range quite significantly um, to try and focus um, our resources on deli on making more physical deliveries for uh, for a, a six to eight week period um, so as a retailer, it goes against all the bones in my body to say, let's have the biggest range, um, the the most competitive pricing for that period. But actually, we had a like a, a social duty um, to, to perform as well at, at the same time. So we actually we actually reduced um, certain elements of our business. But the impact of that was to to make more deliveries to to kind of feed the nation, if you like. So we, we're kind of proud of that at the same time. Um, but what we did around the outside of that, around those restrictions, we actually um, uh, we did a lot of work on live streaming as well. So live streaming became very important to us. So um, we had a lot of uh, KOLs um, that we that we worked with very closely. Um, some of them were literally at home on their iPhone, pretty much like today, uh, filming uh, a, a mixologist who's who's kind of trying to educate consumers about how to make co great cocktails at home. Um, we had a lot of cooks who were, uh, and our suppliers and sellers who were telling us about their amazing products, so like, like Indiguna, for example. Uh, we've got we've got an amazing um, network and ecosystem of sellers and suppliers who do some amazing products. So we worked very closely to get some of these products kind of surfaced to uh, to our consumers as well. And um, and at, at the very beginning of the pandemic in Singapore, we we actually gave a, a live stream with a with a doctor who. Uh, we've got a very um, well-respected doctor in, in Singapore who who gave um, like a, a 101 about how to wear a surgical mask, how to um, how to wash your hands properly, uh, how to correctly social distance. Because at, at, at the beginning of, of the pandemic announcements, it was there's a lot of uh, misinformation, if you like, in 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 the marketplace. So so we we we, we felt by having a, a doctor come in and, and make some. Um, some very simple guidelines for our customers it was really well received as well. And um, 
we all we also extended the live streaming internally as well so we we had a lot of um we've got a lot of very passionate food people in our business so uh, in our internal um, chat system we also had a lot of people who were cooking from home and sharing their recipes with with their colleagues as well so that, that became pretty interesting and fun uh, obviously we were trying to get people to shop and do all their grocery shopping um, with red Mart, but they were they were very keen to show their their granny's favorite recipe for spaghetti bolognese or uh, <laughs> their favorite banana bread recipe so it became quite interesting internally as well so it became really, really quite funny um yeah. and then and then for fun i think just to build on build on a point from on the pindodo experience as well we within the wider lazada group um in in malaysia for example um so the cameron highlands is, is a very uh, large area in in malaysia that, that grow a lot of um produce and and they saw a similar experience where a lot of the wet the traditional wet markets were closed because of the social distancing a lot of the the retailers were on lockdown as well so they had a, a lot of produce that was effectively going to waste so so the the team in malaysia pivoted really quickly and and gave them an outlet to to sell online and which is a pretty interesting experience because a lot of farming and agriculture is is quite old school um, and yeah. traditional in, in their approach and in some ways they saw e-commerce as a, as a as a threat and actually yeah. um i think it's been a, it's been a power for good overall in, in that actually it's it's about feeding people and it's about supporting sellers and suppliers and i think i think we're very proud to have been able to do that pretty quickly um, um and the yeah the, the, the amount in in terms of gmv or the amount in tonnage of product that we sold in malaysia was was pretty phenomenal and you know the the, the reason we all exist as a as a retailer and as a platform is is to is to essentially grow grow the ecosystem and our um our family of sellers and suppliers and to support their yeah, livelihoods so on, was... on your last comment uh, you said that agriculture seems to be a traditional business while it's online retailers and e-commerce is quite the new norm especially in china and we look at the other retailers in the business, they are struggling to meet the pace of the online grocery. So in Israel and in other countries, they were struggling to meet, even the, the regular retailers struggling to meet the demand from consumers for the online shopping or for their deliveries. For you guys, it was quite easy because you've been in this business from day one. This is your business, online groceries, delivery. So you were easy, easily adapting to the new situation. But what I see now is that the, there's a pressure on the traditional retailers and supermarkets and the, uh, even food companies to push up towards to this direction, right? Being online, delivering goods. And for instance, in the States, they issued that last year there was a jump 19% online shopping groceries, but this year they expect to have 40% increase in online shopping. And we saw PepsiCo opening during the, the pandemic in the States, direct online shopping for home eating. Uh, Sini mentioned that you have that already in China, but this is the shift. Are you um, cautious that maybe these will be your new competitors, these traditional retailers, not being online today, but now being pushed to be online? Um, Lenny, yes. are you going to start? Oh, Sini. <laughs> Sure. So um, maybe I'll just chime in. I think um, the general um, sort of consumer behavior in China for e-commerce is quite anchored around the big uh, all category platforms. So like ourselves, Alibaba, JD, right? The consumer prefers to just have, you know, one app where they can shop across a variety of categories. So I think for uh, supermarkets in China, um, the larger chains, they have tried to uh, build up more uh, online delivery, uh, more sort of uh, digital commerce capabilities in the last few years. Uh, and I think this will definitely accelerate the push. But I think from the brand perspective, right, if you're a snack brand owner, uh, we've actually seen a lot of the um, domestic brands as well as overseas brands uh, open up or ramp up their uh, stores on our platform, right? And some of them have actually partnered with us uh, to use some insights on consumer preferences on our platform to um, sort of uh, design brand new uh, products that are more suited to uh, the customer base on Pinduoduo. So one example is or True Love, as the name is translated. So they're about a 20-year-old kind of like snack company in China. And uh, they came on board in, on Pinduoduo in May 2019. 
and um, you know, in a short span of time, they came up with 25 uh, customized SKUs, right, that were actually more targeted towards uh, the kind of customer profile that we see on our platform. So I think for a lot of these brands, it's not just another distribution channel, it's also two ways, right? So by selling online, you also get more real-time inputs and feedback from your clients about, well, what sort of snacks do people like to eat, right? And then if you see, you know, uh, unexpectedly something is picking up and, and really catching fire, then you're like, oh gosh, okay, this is this is the new hit product, right? Whereas I think if you go through the traditional kind of offline retail route, right, with the distributors, et cetera, there is also a bit of a time lag, right? And it may be quite some time before you then realize like, oh, there is this trend, right? Or this flavor is really popular. I should step up the production there. So I think this is something that we'll continue to see uh, I've um, sort of heard a few domestic brands in China as well talk about how they will increase their investments to make online distribution uh, a bigger part of their revenues this year. So I think generally because the market is relatively um, underpenetrated, right, because people historically bought these things uh, offline, right, whether it's fresh produce or snacks. So I think it's still a wide enough market whereby, you know, ourselves, the e-commerce platforms, as well as the traditional retailers still have a pretty good room to grow. So uh, I think it's still a relatively uh, positive outlook for the industry in China. A very diplomatic answer, Sini. <laughs> 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 Helen, how about you? <laughs> Maybe for, you know, high body produce, the competition will be less tough. Well, I mean, I think that our online, like you mentioned before, prim, prim, prior to the COVID-19, we were very focused on serving the industry professionals. And today, because of this COVID-19, we ourselves have actually pivoted to be an online delivery grocers also to provide the uh, restaurant quality or the more premium quality to household. But prior to that, we have never been in that space. But today, within six weeks, we have put on our online platform and telling people that we have the products that used to be served in five-star hotels, three Michelin star restaurants. And um, I think that I will be more like, I won't say that we're a competition, definitely not, not with the Red Mart or the big uh, supermarket retailers, but I think today we are all carving out a niche to be able to pivot. And actually in, in general terms is that um, we will see that the shift of the business model will change dramatically. Before, uh, before this happened, we were focused on professionals and the industry. Today, even the, the, the COVID-19 will say settle down and in Singapore, they slowly will open up. The comeback will be very, very slow. And we do as a business need to find ways to continue our business and continue what we're doing. So I won't say that we have left such a big mark, but our big job today is support actually um, over 20 years, our retailers, um, our customers, which we are uh, focusing on B2B2C. So particularly B2C is not really so much of our business, it's, but more so B2B2C. So a lot of our clients today, which we are supporting through service, through products, through innovation is actually the retailers themselves. So actually Red Mart is one of our customers as well. Uh, that we do, uh, we do support uh, RedMart with a range of innovative products. And that's actually mm -hmm. really our job because actually, to be very honest, let's just, today if you ask me, are we professionals in B2C? Absolutely not. But we have to do something because of our business model has changed actually overnight. So yeah. actually, I don't see that we will be in that such big space and you know, talking about, wow, you know, what is our grand plan in online delivery? but our grand plan is continue to support our B2B2C platform so that our retailers have continuous, because actually our job is about looking for products, innovation, what are the trends that people are looking for. And over the last two, 20, 30 years of business within the group, our job is about looking around the world for the best, best products and what people are looking for. And I think we will continue to do that. And of course, we will continue to promote our premium quality products for the household um, so that's, that's where our current uh, business position will be. Okay. Richard? Yeah, I, I, I think, and, and this, is, this is not a political answer at all, I think that there's, there's definitely a, a way for this to coexist. Um, and I think from a, if you look at online particularly, if you look at the, the products that people buy, there's, there's, there's two very different, um, in my mind anyway, there's two very different ways. Um, I think that there's products that you buy every, every single week um, uh, week in, week out, your, your high, high, highly consumable products. Um, um, and then there's also your, your products you buy for a treat, uh, for a birthday, for a party, for a, 
um, for a special event or for a seasonal um, period. And that's, that's where um, these, these channels will coexist. And I think um, you know, you, it's, that, that's what, that it's also an opportunity for, for these product categories to be premiumized as well. And I think, um, as Helen's mentioned there, that there's, there's products, um, wait, wait, in, in innovation is, is the driver for, for the category. And um, I think as, as a retailer, you know, there, there are certain products that, that you don't think about buying when you buy them because it's, it's something that's in your kitchen cupboard or your, or your, um, or your bathroom for your, your, your kind of daily essential needs and your, your um, rituals. Um, but then, then there's products that you, you really think about. And, and I think that, that that's one benefit that we've seen anyway from a Redmark perspective is, is we have such a uh, an eclectic range and a very wide range of products that people, now they've been at home for a little bit, um, they're taking a bit more time to, and they're a bit more considerate in terms of what they're, they're buying. So they're, they're buying more categories. Um, they've A lot of people got a, a newfound love of baking. So if you look on Instagram, people are doing a lot of baking and yeah. showing all their friends how good they are at baking. Um, and there's, there's things like that which, which are, are trends that I think that, that will stick and they'll become part of their their online shopping repertoire, I think, going forward. Um, but I, th I think the other thing for me that's, that's that's coming out of this is is the convenience element. So t time really is money. And, and I think if you're, there, there's, a, there's, a, there's a semi misconception anyway that, that going to the store at the weekend is, is really good and it's a nice way to get out, out of the house and exercise your children. But actually it's it's a bit of a chore if you think about it um so if, if you can if you can purchase certain categories online and i think that that will become the norm um but then if, if you're looking for a bit of inspiration then you may go into a store uh you may do some window shopping but then come back and buy online but it's i think the the in-store experience is still still very important and that, that, that's not going to go away anytime soon so before we move to the q a from the audience um, I have two questions for you that I would like the three of you to answer short to keep the pace running. So the first question is, what do you think would be the main impact of the pandemic on, on your industry for the long run, three to five years from now, if at all? Sini. Sure. So I think the impact of the pandemic is uh, broadly supportive, right, of uh, further growth and penetration of e-commerce. And I think the other point that I would call is actually it's highlighted um, how important that sense of community is, right, and uh, social trust between people. And I think this will actually push the industry more towards thinking about how we can still replicate these elements online. So I really like the point that uh, Richard made earlier, right, about how, you know, his customers are engaging by showing pictures, right, of what they're making with their Redmark purchases, right? They're also showing off, you know, their bread baking skills, etc. So I think that sense of you know, human connection is something that's very important. And at Pinduoduo, because our uh, entire shopping experience is centered around a team purchase, right, whereby you get a lower price if you buy together with a friend. Right. So it's driven around people making recommendations to each other. And I think in a time where, you know, um, things may be more uncertain or you may be forced to buy things that you didn't really have to buy before, like, you know, uh, surgical masks, then you actually do rely more on uh, your friends recommendations. So I think that is going to be a big theme that uh, I think the e-commerce industry, as well as all sorts of other digital industries, will definitely explore more deeply in future. And then? Well, I think in our industry, particularly in the restaurants and hotels business, um, definitely I think there will be a shift in digitalization, whether it's at less contact with, like if you dine in, less contact with menu, less contact with uh, people. I think definitely that will change a lot. I think businesses in general, whether, you know, we've already seen a huge wave of digitalization, but I think this COVID-19 has further pushed it further where, you know, your apps uh, as a company, uh, as a business, uh, apps and digitalization is absolutely important. I think this also changed, like in our business before, I could never believe, as Richard mentioned earlier, it's very difficult to convert people to buy fresh food online. But I think today it has proven in the last two months, three months in Singapore that you can actually get people to buy fresh foods online. And now they've experienced it, that this is going to be the new model and that people have no problems to buy fresh food online once you establish trust and um, the, 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 the convincing of people that a, you can actually deliver on time, you can, um, you can actually get, get great pro product quality without actually looking at the product itself. So I think just digitalization in all aspects of our business where it was never imaginable before, 
it is absolutely imaginable today. And convenience, and absolutely true what Richard said, I totally agree that ready to eat, time is the essence, time is money. People are looking, maybe not 100% everything, but for sure a big part of their lives will be like, can I eat well? Because actually at the end of the day, everybody does need to eat well. And eating well is actually primarily very important for everyone, but maybe more convenience, uh, less time taken to cook, um, and those kind of things would definitely will stay. Richard? I think I, I won't. I won't dwell on on fresh fresh food and convenience. I think I think uh, Helen's mentioned that already. I, I, I agree with that completely. Uh, I think for me, from a brand perspective, if you're a seller or a supplier, I think um, brand brands have, have realised that actually, um, and we've been fighting this cause for quite a, quite some time. And, and a lot of our partners we work with are more advanced than others um, in some cases. But I think there's a realisation that e-commerce is very different, and you can't copy and paste your business plan that you have with your offline retailer, your online retailer, it's, it's very, very different. Um, and as an online retailer, we, we can be much more agile than a, a, a store based model. We've got lots of shelves to fill and lots of um, kind of infrastructure to, to manage. So, so I think whether, I think Helen mentioned earlier, whether it's uh, a bespoke niche product for us as a retailer, we're, we're doing a lot more of that now because of this. So um, there's a lot of agility there, I think to go forward and, and I think also just people are much more aware of where the food comes from. So um, I think we mentioned, I forgot who mentioned earlier about plant-based foods, but um, in, in, in the event where we had some shortages of meat and seafood in the initial phases, people have seemed to explore and be quite happy with whether it's dairy-free milk or um, um, meat-free um, plant-based proteins from that perspective. So mm -hmm. that, I think that's been accelerated a little bit as well. So. Yeah, I see that continue. So maybe to tap into that, as a venture capitalist, I have to ask, what do you think would be the technology, the next technology to be induced into the industry going forward the, the pandemic? Tini? So I think I kind of alluded to it earlier. I think, um, you know, live streaming definitely will get a, a boost out of um, the pandemic, right? So I think people have appetite to actually uh, take the time and uh, maybe dig a bit more about, hey, how is this thing produced, right? Where is it coming from, right? In, in exchange for what maybe they would have done previously offline, right? If I go to, uh, you know, a specialty butcher, right? I can ask the butcher all these questions. But if I'm now trying to do these things online, um, um, I, uh, you know, for instance, uh, we had an example of Argentinian shrimp, right? Uh, on our platform a few months ago, we actually held a live streaming session with a chef, right? To actually showcase, uh, you know, this is the Argentinian shrimp. This is how it looks different from maybe the typical shrimp that you buy in the Chinese market. And this is how you should prepare it. And then we could also show them and give them some background on this is how the shrimp has traveled from Argentina uh, over to um, Shanghai, right? And we uh, liaised with a export partner uh, on that. So I think this is a, um, probably a longer term trend, right? More people will be interested in um, different, richer sort of uh, forms of information dissemination. So it's like social blockchain. If I Almost, may say. right? Yeah, because yeah. You, can, you can relay sort of the customer experience, customer preferences, which we as a platform have a sense of, right? Maybe the typical household size uh, that is buying these things at certain size, they prefer the shrimp to be maybe in a 1.5 kilogram box, not three kilogram or five kilogram, yeah. which could have been how the, the, the exporters were packaging it when they were shipping to restaurants, right? But yeah. uh, we're able to sort of refine the type of SKUs that we need at the same time uh, for the consumers, right? They get to see sort of the behind the scenes and have more comfort that like, yeah, I can buy a premium product online. It's no problem at all. Yeah. So let's do it quickly with Helen and Richard. One thing that you see from a technology perspective being induced in the industry. But definitely. Helen? The v same with the Pinduoduo, same. I think that the video live streaming is important to show. Um, used to be a picture speaks a thousand words. Today will be video that speaks a thousand words. Richard? I, I agree, agree. I, I, we, we, we call it social commerce, but it's, yeah, live, live streaming is, is, will, be, will be big. But I think from a, from a purely, uh, from my perspective also, um, automation from a, an operations perspective is going to form a big part of our strategy and, and that's about reducing the lead time from, from what we call click, click to deliver. So trying to get that, that convenience element online um, increased. Yeah. So be before we end, maybe we, the guys can show us the poll. There was a poll uh, being, uh, uh, yeah, there we have it. Um, 
Do you say products online? That's pretty obvious. <laughs> uh, okay. Do you think COVID-19 has helped you to make a transition to more online sales? Uh, I would say for sure, especially Helen, for you, right? Uh, for consumers mainly. Okay. And uh, let's see. How long do you think consumer trends uh, for more value driving products over luxury products as you COVID-19 persist? Okay. Not too long. Only one year. Most of the people said so. Uh, how important has uh, e-commerce become for you this year due to COVID-19? Okay, I think it's an obvious question for all of you guys. This is your main business. <laughs> but with that, I'd like to, to end the session. And thank you, uh, a few of you, for a very interesting panel. And have a great day, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.